manufacture of automobiles is America's greatest single industry. From the birth of the automobile industry in 1895 to 1942, when war stopped car production, 90 million motor vehicles were built in the United States. One out of every seven gainfully employed Americans earns his livelihood directly or indirectly from the automobile. Of the 90 million vehicles built to 1942, 30 million are still on the highway. Most of these, according to previous standards, need replacement now. As war chokes civilian production to a standstill, the automotive industry performed the miracle of conversion that helped still German and Japanese war machines. Never in history has so much been made in so little time. Nearly five million guns of all kinds and multitudes of shells, three and a half million engines, two and a half million tanks and trucks, to mention just a portion of the motor car industry's war production. War production stockpiles were so great that even before VJ Day, the industry could turn to a limited civilian production again. It moved fast to create jobs and products needed by post-war America. The demand for new cars was so pressing, there was no time for gaudy trimmings and super streamlining. We just wanted good, substantial automobiles. Manufacturers were ready to shift into high gear production. America needed at least 10 million new cars almost at once. As the war came to an abrupt end, production problems began to manifest themselves. All industries suddenly had to have essential raw materials for civilian production. Steel, textiles, wood, copper, and hundreds of other basic products were in tremendous demand for home building, furniture making, and other fabricating. The available supply was hit hard and had to be spread thinly. As the flow of supplies and materials became a trickle, production lines in motor car factories were sharply curtailed. Production schedules were knocked out. Again and again, the industry was unable to meet goals previously set. Time after time, partially completed cars were stalled on the conveyors for lack of some seemingly insignificant parts. What are the real reasons for the shortage of automobiles? Well, let's take a look behind the scenes. Today, showroom floors do not have much for Mr. and Mrs. America to choose from. In the first seven months of production after the war, the average dealer was lucky to have received two cars. Of course, a lot of folks placed orders for new cars even during the war. But as millions of men were released from service, they added to the backlog of orders. Held up by countless interruptions, however, the motor car industry has filled the needs of only one customer for every three it had expected to accommodate. Many buyers took delivery of new cars without bumpers, rear seats, hubcaps, and other parts not affecting the operation of the car. Hardest hit in the waiting process were the dealers who had to take the brunt of customers' dissatisfaction. Although most new car dealers continue to take orders, they warned prospective buyers that production uncertainties made it wise to nurse their present cars as long as possible. New car salesmen today are busily repeating the shortage story to customers. There are a multitude of reasons for the scarcity of new passenger cars. Let us, through this medium, step behind the scenes of the fabulous automotive industry and discover firsthand what is delaying your new car. Let's get the facts from the industry itself. The Automobile Manufacturers Association has made an exhaustive study of the current production situation. And here are the facts. Original plans were to step up production month by month, as this chart shows, leveling off at a rate of approximately 500,000 cars after a full year of operation. Actually, the monthly increase was drastically under this early estimate. As a matter of fact, there were months when output fell instead of increased. The profit and loss chart of the automobile business somewhat reflects the national economic conditions. There has been a profit consistently except during the depth of the Depression and in the post-war period. Prospects are better for the coming months. Strangely enough, employment is higher now than in 1941, with almost 700,000 employees making motor vehicles. Current payrolls show a tremendous jump over pre-war wage payments. Only passenger car output is shown here. Despite record-breaking replacement parts production and volume truck manufacture, total production has been below 1941.
no comparison between post-war eras following the two wars. After World War I, the drop was negligible. But in the first nine months after World War II, only 20% of the pre-war output was reached, despite far greater manufacturing facilities existing today. Now let us see what the leaders of the industry have to say about the current situation. George W. Mason, president of the Nash Calvinator Corporation and the Automobile Manufacturers Association says, all we need to accomplish full production at Nash is a free flow of supplies. While many of the barriers to full production have recently been eliminated, others remain. Until all of these are discarded, the automobile industry cannot expect to have the quantities of materials essential to volume production. Willis Overland Motors president James D. Mooney says, I think 47 will be a lot better than 46. There are signs of the country wanting to go back to work. We seem to have to put some of our post-war spree behind us. We have the resources and the tools. Let's take off our coats and go back to work and make 1947 a good year. Weissler Corporation President K.T. Keller, in his latest report to stockholders, explained that the immediate difficulty on production arises from the shortage of materials. The flat steel situation is typical and most outstandingly important. Hudson Motor Company's President A.E. Barrett says, the production achieved has been accomplished through extraordinary effort and at higher cost than anticipated for the procurement of material. We have no assurance of better conditions in the foreseeable future. C.E. Wilson, president of General Motors, recently said, I wish you could go with me through our operations and see what we are doing in a desperate effort to fill production gaps, keep the workmen employed, and satisfy our customers who have been waiting so long for the new cars they need so badly. Paul Hoffman, president of the Studebaker Corporation, says, we're all set to double the current rate of our passenger car production, provided we can get enough material. But as a salesman, I regret to say that it doesn't mean everyone who wants a new 1947 Studebaker will be able to get delivery immediately. The first serious roadblock to immediate new car manufacture was reconversion from war work. Acres of peacetime tools had to be brought out from storage, cataloged, reconditioned, and set up where war equipment machinery stood. Reconversion was no simple task. War production differed greatly from peacetime manufacture. The unique layout of automobile assembly lines required elaborate planning to accomplish the switchover in the least possible time. Again, as for war, the industry shattered all estimates of time required to complete the job. In many cases, the job involved tremendous structural changes. Of course, during the changeover, there was no production line. Your new car was being delayed several months, but work went ahead at an accelerated pace. Nearly all companies looked to production that would not only match, but exceed pre-war capacities and initiated new construction. A typical reconversion problem facing one manufacturer was the moving and reinstallation of over 20,000 machines. This equipment ranged in size from small drill presses and lathes to giant hydraulic presses weighing as much as 150 tons, a grand total of more than 3 million tons of machinery, dyes, and other equipment was handled in the one plant. Included in the operation was a tremendous time-consuming job of rebuilding many of the machines from war equipment producing units back to auto building units. While victory in Europe reduced military requirements, a few companies faced larger war orders after VE Day than before. However, the battle to win the peace had to be waged simultaneously. Auto companies rushed plant retooling, ordering of materials and parts to provide jobs for released war workers and returning veterans. Some plants were actually reconverted before VJ Day. The physical part of the job was over three months after final victory. The expected long period of mass unemployment following the war was avoided. Reconversion speed equal that of converting for war. Plans for car production were rushed to completion. Now the industry was ready. But what is there to making an automobile? Well, let's see. The automobile production line begins in the earth. 
A steady flow of raw materials from the earth to the factory is the first must of car production. Grain is needed for paints and varnishes, wool for upholstery and floor coverings, cowhides for leather in your car. Even beeswax goes into automobile manufacturing. Thousands of bales of cotton, corn. Supplies from 44 states are used. Sugarcane for essential chemicals. Turpentine for paints. Four-fifths of all the world's rubber goes into automobiles for tires, insulation, windshield wiper blades, to name just a few uses. Products from 60 countries are needed. Millions of feet of lumber, too. Coal to provide power and drive the tools of industry. And then, of course, the most vital of all automotive raw materials, iron ore. Most automobile iron ore comes from the tremendous Minnesota and Michigan mine pits. It is transported to the steel mills aboard the famous long ships of the Great Lakes. Roughly three-fourths of every car is made of iron and steel. Yes, these things are the lifeblood of the automotive industry. Once within the walls of the factories, the raw materials are miraculously transformed through quantity production methods. This animated chart is the best possible illustration of the secret of automotive mass production. The center path is the main assembly line. The side avenues are supply points. Now, to understand the new car shortage, you must realize that if even one of these supply avenues lacks even one component part, it disrupts the entire main line. Supplies to the main line must be timed to precision accuracy. Now, think of the supply avenues as raw materials, manpower, paint, carburetors, crankshafts, and some 15,000 different parts, and you'll begin to understand the miracle of the automotive production line. Actually, however, a visitor to a modern automobile plant views what he sees with astonishment. Confusion rather than simplicity and order seem to dominate. Parts and materials appear to be streaming in haphazardly from all corners of the factory. Yet each workstation, each conveyor line, each tool is accurately placed with just the right amount of parts and materials reaching a given location on a strictly controlled time schedule. As you watch them, keep in mind the animated chart just shown. Partially completed new car motors move by conveyor from point to point where other components are added. As the engines travel along the line, they are subjected to periodic inspection. Manifolds are installed. Next come flywheels that make your motor run smoothly. Pans are now added. Near the end of the long assembly line, transmissions are attached. By conveyor, completed engines move to the break-in blocks. Here they are run at various speeds over extended periods of time. Here is where your motor undergoes its acid test and where the rough edges are polished to perfection through actual operation. When this motor rolls again, it will be within that new car the industry hopes to deliver to you soon. Let's talk about this export problem now. The automotive industry must trade in foreign markets. It must buy materials which are not obtainable in America. By the same token, it must sell a portion of its output to people in other lands for the good of our own economy. Frequently, cars are built in this country, shipped in parts, and reassembled upon arrival. Remember this. One out of every 10 Americans working in the auto industry was dependent on foreign sales for his livelihood in pre-war years. A limited number of new cars are going to overseas customers. Such export is under strict government control. Currently, the automotive industry is sending only one out of every 20 cars produced to overseas consumers, 
less than is permitted. Most foreign shipments have gone to nations in North and South America, although China, India, Belgium, Holland, France, Australia, and other countries have received quotas. These are important markets for tomorrow. Thus, the automotive industry's production lines actually extend to the four corners of the earth. Indians, Frenchmen, Belgians, Brazilians, and others, they all benefit. Very important to the industry, however, are the vital imports it needs to keep the line moving. Chromite, nickel, tin, vanadium, hemp, rubber, and a thousand others. These must all come from overseas. Therefore, the flow of material, raw and finished, must be maintained both ways. We cannot afford to overlook our foreign market as a preservation of our national economy. Auto executives feel the pressure of current demand. George Christopher, president of Packard Motor Car Company, for example, recently undertook a nationwide tour by air to bring first-hand facts about the current and future production situation to company dealers. He met with sales representatives in seven key cities. With a more complete understanding of the company's struggles, dealers are better able to cope with their customers' requirements. In meetings such as this, dealers learned how recurring shortages of various small parts have time and again stalled production and forced this one company to cut back schedules 13 times in 1946, an example of events that occurred in all automotive companies. Negative telegrams in response to frantic appeals for supplies underscored the problems confronting all producers. What are some of the typical small parts causing such large headaches? Well, there are roller bearings, rubber bearing seals, brake springs, copper bushings and control arm bushings, thermostats, pistons, clutch pressure springs, transmission counter gear and shafts, control arm shafts, cotton work gloves, even paper and cartons for shipping. Multiply these by many thousands. That's what's tied up production lines, even entire plants. The flow of such parts must be maintained at all costs. Special departments of procurement experts and expediters have been built up by companies to scour the country for desperately needed supplies. It's a costly practice. As a matter of fact, there are more automotive employees engaged in expediting work today than at any time during the war years. When a supply of scarce items is located by the expediters, companies resort to expensive extremes to get equipment to the hungry production lines. Planes are very often chartered. Meeting and loading one of these air giants is just as carefully timed as the flow of parts to the final assembly line. Vital odds and ends are flown to assembly points daily from feeder plants across the nation. In fact, as soon as the plane's wheels have lifted from the ground, word is flashed to the factory that the precious cargo is being winged through the air. As the ship speeds toward its destination, the waiting plant moves into action. Workmen, tools, assembly lines, delivery trucks are set to receive the supply. Coming into Detroit a few short hours after its takeoff, the plane looks down on the city's giant automobile plant. At famous Willow Run Airport, the pilot eases the irreplaceable shipment to the ground. Taxis up the runway with an eye feel for the delivery trucks which are to receive the supply. It swings into the landing circle and eases to a stop. Crew members are ready to disgorge the automobile supplies, waiting only for delivery trucks to take them away. The schedule has been met, and on time, production can continue for another day. The industry's fame mechanization is even reflected during unloading. Unless the parts are fed into production lines almost immediately, a full day of manufacturing can be lost. The flow of materials must be maintained at all costs. Here is another shortcut. It's the Pony Express a method of employing huge trucks and trailers and relays to cover long distances, patterned after the legendary Pony Express of Wild West days. 
Frequently, vital bulky material is moved by this device. It's a precisely timed operation with trucks loaded at one point and unloaded at another several hundred miles away at just the right time. Let's follow one of these trucks as it rushes a load of cushions from one point to another. Rubber-tired wheels begin to turn and the mammoth truck trailer with its essential load moves on to the highway. The first leg of a 630-mile journey is underway. Dusk overtakes the swiftly moving truck. It's a clear night, good driving weather, and the vehicle roars toward its destination, the fate of several thousand jobs and cars in its care. Ahead, there's an important rendezvous. Near midnight, the big van arrives at an improvised wayside terminal, just halfway to the end of the line. There, ready and waiting, is a second powerful truck. The trailer is uncoupled and quickly hooked to the new vehicle. Only a few seconds consumed here. No chance to shoot the breeze. Time's too precious in the battle to keep automobiles flowing to customers and workers from being laid off for the lack of a park. Back onto the highway goes the combination, the modern day Pony Express. By such means as this, our critical items shuffle between suppliers' plants and automotive factories, raw materials and important components. The list is long, the cost is high, but the end justifies the means. Early the next morning, just 19 hours later, the truck rolls up the drive to the needy plant. It's seven in the morning, men swarm to their jobs. When they get to their benches, desks, and assembly line stations, the plant will swing into high gear. No break in production today, thanks to a couple of sturdy truck drivers last night. End of the plant it goes. Production lines can keep rolling, thanks to today's Pony Express. You can't make an automobile without steel. Since the end of the war, iron ore has been fed into blast furnaces and steel rolled out at the highest peacetime rate in history. Yet the lack of sufficient steel has been the automotive industry's most pressing problem. One of the many steps in the process of making steel, white hot coke, is dumped into cars for delivery to blast furnaces. Reduced to a liquid at about 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit, iron streams out of the blast furnace in a hissing, sparking river. The transformation into steel has begun. Let's look inside a steel mill and see what it takes to make this most necessary of all automotive materials. Alloys are added to the mixture brewing in the furnaces. A pinch of this metal is added, a touch of that metal, until just the right quality needed for automobile production is compound. Here you see the ingots being removed from the heating furnaces on their way to the rolling mills. Now the ingot has become a slab. Reheated, it slides to the finishing mill, enters the rolls to emerge as a sheet of shiny steel which will end up in many different places in a motor car. Hoods, bodies, fenders, and cowls, to name some of the most important parts. Of the $1 million worth of material which flows into motor car plants daily under normal operations, sheet steel comprises the greatest portion. Thus, car production must be geared to the rate of supply and delivery of steel products. Many ingenious conservation practices have been developed within the industry. Here's a typical example of one that has helped companies maintain output of cars. After each operation, there remains an excess of metal around the edges of the park. These pieces are then fed into a device which looks like a washing machine wringer. Smoothed out, the trims are used in machines which punch out smaller parts. The board you're looking at contains a sample of every trim from every operation where salvage is possible. Each of these pieces is fed back into the plant's productive processes again and again until all usable material is consumed. Trims like those on the display board are what these workmen are using to punch out small parts. Leftover material will be turned back for still further salvaging. 
Normally, excess trims would be merely collected and returned to steel mills as scrap. Nowadays, everything is carefully salvaged. Even floors are swept for salvage purposes. Nothing is allowed to go to waste. Shavings from grinding and cutting machines are swept into handy containers by operators. As the material is collected, it is fed into a machine for baling. Dumped into a chamber, the scrap is compressed into solid bales. Scrap is an extremely necessary ingredient for steel making. It adds to the quality. Automatically loaded on a conveyor, the bales are now carried to another part of the plant. At the end of the conveyor line, the scrap is dumped into a furnace. Are material shortages affecting new car quality? How can they with constant policing? Among the 2,000 tests given all new cars is this one. A sample of every batch of steel is sent to a laboratory where composition is analyzed. Steel chips from this drilling operation are sampled in another test. Delicately balanced scales were employed by laboratory technicians to ferret out secrets. Manufacturing chemicals are carefully and regularly tested. All the tools of science were employed in the modern automotive laboratory. X-rays turn up structural defects in metal parts. The life expectancy of a car's spring is learned from this test. Wear and tear on upholstery is studied with this device. Powerful synthetic sun rays test color fastness of material. How efficient are protective coatings? This test tells automotive engineers the facts. Your new car must be able to withstand the most rigorous tests for safety. Americans need millions of good, solid, substantial cars. The nation's greatest single industry is exerting every last effort to meet the demand as soon as possible. The new products are better than ever. We have maintained world leadership in quality and quantity. We must all work toward keeping ahead of the field throughout the world market. Soon it will be a buyer's market again. Our products must be as strong and durable as our way of life. Post-war strength must be consistent with our wartime show of power. Indeed, those of us who have personal needs must be ready to give all American industry time to catch up with these new days of peace. The auto industry marching forward with other great sources of national production will triumph because it is the will of all Americans. It's through the daily labors of all of us that we will finally see a happy, prosperous, and bountiful American democracy. These facts came from the industry itself. These scenes are a composite of the automobile picture today the manufacturer, the worker, and the dealer. They're all anxious to fulfill your needs in modern transportation. Mr. and Mrs. America, 10 million of you need cars. That's a big order, but we'll fill it. That's a lot of cars, but we'll build them. 10 million and more, lots more. Business has faith, labor has faith. And America has faith in the nation's greatest single industry, the automobile industry. <laughs>